everyone and welcome to today's Plante webinar focusing on a guide to political activism for early career plant scientists. My name is Katie Rogers and I'm your host for today's webinar. This webinar series is brought to you today by Plante, the open online community for plant scientists powered by the American Society of Plant Biologists. I would like to give a special thank you to all of our ASPB members who are attending today. Your ASPB membership dues help support and make these webinars possible. For any of you who have not yet joined ASPB, you can join today and use the discount code WEBINAR10 to receive a 10% discount on registration. ASPB members get early access to these seminars. You can learn more about ASPB and the opportunities we provide at ASPB.org. Today's webinar was organized by ASPB's Early Career Plant Scientists Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Subcommittee. If you're an early career plant scientist, I would like to encourage you to join this section as well. Membership is only $5 and is a great way to get engaged. You can join this group even if you are not already an ASPB member. In a few moments, I'll share a link to the network on Plante so that you can learn a little bit more about this group and get connected. Patrick Thomas, who is currently the head of the Early Career Plant Scientist Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Subcommittee, and who is a PhD candidate, finishing up his dissertation at the University of California, Riverside, is here with us today to share a little bit more info about the ES ECPS section and to introduce today's speaker. I'd like to give a huge thank you to Patrick for leading the charge and setting up this webinar on this very important topic. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Katie, for the introduction. Um, so with that, it is uh, my pleasure to um i'm sorry i thought i lost um my zoom <laughs> so with that it's my pleasure to introduce the guest speaker for this second part of this webinar series that the edi committee has put on to try to channel the energy that some of us have um, seeing things that have gone on over the last year and a half in the pandemic and use it to try a better society. So um, our first seminar was with Dr. Sharon Milgram talking about mental health and how institutions can better serve um, early career researchers um, in academic and professional institutions. And here I am very, very, very um, honored and privileged to have somebody who um, the former ASPB ECPS uh, chair, Rishi Masalia knows, uh, Hallie Thompson. Um, her experiences are in the public and private sector, and um, she has a passion for bridging bridges between building bridges between science policy and communication and business development. Along the way, she has studied biochemistry, plant biology, and more recently biophysics and microbiology, which has given her the ability to bridge diverse areas of scientific expertise. She studied at the graduate and professional student body. She served as the graduate and professional student body president at the University of Missouri for two years during graduate school, and she advocated for graduate worker pay and other rights. Shortly thereafter, she co-founded the Missouri Science and Technology Fellowship Program in 2016. That program now has placed two cohorts of fellows as resources for the uh, Missouri State Legislature. Probably the most out of norm experience on her resume though would be her run for Congress in 2018, through which she learned just how much room there is for growth and the divide between science and policy. And currently she works as an independent consultant in the science policy space and management spaces, working with nonprofits and small for-profit businesses. And today um, I'm very privileged to introduce her as she will talk about how early career researchers can get involved in policy and activism. So with that, Howie, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Patrick. Let me see, I'm not seamless with sharing my screen here. All right, there we go. So I was going to try to do this without slides. And then I started to realize that uh, the more I tried to talk through it without slides, the more meandering uh, my story became. I was planning to start off uh, talking to you all a little bit about my personal experiences uh, and how those personal experiences have been so important to my engagement um, as an early career scientist in the public sector. So being engaged with policymakers uh, at all different levels 
has required me to have some personal experiences uh, that I can relate to them with. And so I wanted to start off kind of trying to explain to you that I would call it a meandering journey. Um, and some of the touch points along the way that I thought were really key for me and might be really key for you as well. Um, one thing I find uh, that can be really challenging with these kind of talks though, is that any experiences I have um, are not something that you're going to necessarily share. So I'm gonna try to call out um, along the way some of like the key concepts or the key things I observed or you know something or another that I reflected at the time uh, that was really important for me um, and might also be for you. And then in the second part of the talk, um, after we have time for a few questions, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about, I guess more broadly ways that you can start to get involved at different levels. So some ideas for touch points, um, places you can contact people that might be really key uh, for you that might be good mentors. Um, and then thinking through areas uh, that you might wanna advocate in. And that can include things at your university, state level, federal, um, and then getting creative from there. All right, so jumping right in. Uh, so I ran for the US House of Representatives or US Congress uh, in 2018, um, but I didn't do that in a vacuum. I didn't just one day wake up in 2017 and say, I'm gonna run for office, I think. Uh, I could have done that, and you know, I, I probably would have still been able to have a have a campaign and have you know staffers and be able to go out and talk with constituents and run, but it wouldn't have been the same. It wouldn't have felt the same. I wouldn't have known as much um, about myself, about policy, and about my community if I hadn't had the many experiences that I did running up to that. Um, so just. To give you a little bit of background, I did my undergraduate at the University of Missouri in biochemistry. And at the time I took almost 100% just science courses. I mean, uh, one semester, I think it was in 21 hours and it was all science. <laughs> and then I got into my junior year and realized I was getting really close to graduating and hadn't done a lot of exploring. I hadn't really gotten involved with my community I hadn't gotten to know Columbia, Missouri, where I was at the University of Missouri very well. Um, and I decided to start to jump into that because I had always been interested in my community when I was a kid. Um, and my parents had really modeled that for me too, being involved with the school board and other uh, community institutions. And so I took a class, I just found it uh, on the register and jumped in called Science and Public Policy. And thank goodness I did that because the two professors who were teaching that course were so different. One was a biochemistry professor and the other one was a former elected official in the state house in Missouri. And those two and the way they taught that class as a bridge between science and policy and the way they from such different backgrounds came together and worked together so well just at the time really astounded me and made me really proud of them and seeing the kind of challenges that they had gone through and actually advocating for issues and then deciding to teach this course after having advocated for issues uh, was really inspiring. Um, and Vicki Ryback Wilson, uh, the former elected official who was one of, one of the professors actually is one of my friends to this day who I talk to and use as a touchstone whenever I'm coming up against something challenging or need someone to, to be sort of the angel on my shoulder who's saying, hey, it's okay. You know, you don't, you don't need to freak out about this. Like this, this is something we've been through before. Um, and so that really started to pique my interest more here in Missouri politics uh, after that course. And so I started getting involved in the county and at the University of Missouri here locally so that I could start to build connections that would be helpful for whatever it was that I wanted to do in the future. Because at that point, I didn't know. I was like, I'm interested in science. I'm interested in policy. And I really enjoy seeing how we can make structures better, how we can make better policies. And so I just started to ask, why do we do this? And and when things started to seem wrong, I asked, well, why are we doing it that way? And how can we do it better? Um, and 
once I started asking those questions, I started finding organizations here at the University of Missouri that were asking the same question. So one example is the graduate student body where I was the president um, in 2014, 2015, I was able to start to work on graduate student debt and loans and the interest rates associated with those. Um, through finding that organization and the policies that they were working on, I was able to increase my knowledge in that area and to meet other people both here locally in Missouri and also nationally that were interested in that issue. I built my own um, background in it and I learned from my colleagues. Uh, I also started to get involved with American Society of Plant Biologists at that same time through the early career position on their science policy committee. I applied for that because I wanted to learn more about how my professional society, ASPB, was advocating. Um, and then through that position on the science policy committee, I visited DC. Uh, I was able to advocate for issues within plant biology, along with other researchers that were a part of that committee, um, and to think through strategy. You know, how, how could we best talk about these complicated issues to people that were not subject area experts. Uh, and then I kind of at the culmination and right before I ran uh, for Congress in 2018, uh, I started diving more into how federal policy and state policy um, really rely on one another. Um, and especially in Missouri where we we struggle with funding for our research institutions from the state. Um, we struggle to have relationships with our state government um, that aren't volatile um, and we have term limits. So building those relationships is something that you're constantly doing. Um, and so myself and two colleagues found that there was a need for an institution that would be able to have scientists that are in positions like the AAAS um, science policy fellows but at the state level. So we funded, or we founded the Missouri Science and Technology Policy Fellows Program uh, to step into a role like that and to help legislators and executive um, branch members to understand how science would apply to the policies they were trying to implement. Um, and also to connect them to scientists in the state and to different organizations in the state as well that they may not be aware of. Uh, and then, I wanted to underscore as well that, you know, this is my personal experience and journey and it's really been uh, led by my interest areas and the people that I've met along the way and the things that I've been passionate about and everyone's going to have their own journey that's driven by your interest and your passion and the things that you decide to say yes to. Um, and that doesn't make it wrong, that just makes it yours. So my main takeaways from this that I think are relevant um, you have to have a team to work with. If that team is formal, great. If that team is informal, also great. Uh, either way, I think it's really important to have people that are able to look at things that you're writing or ideas that you have and give you really good insight in those, um, to have really honest conversations about that. I also think something that was really important is organizational buy-in uh, to any projects you're working on um, in order to provide you resources outside of you yourself. Though we can do things you know, independently and probably very successfully, it's, it takes a lot of our bandwidth to do that. And so having an organization that already has a structure or funding or relationships, a network, to rely on um, and be able to go to that organization and say, I have this great idea. I think we should try to implement this policy or we need to talk to this legislator about this policy um, that can be really key in the success of a movement. And then uh, having those core projects. So, so knowing something is your priority. Um, so within you know, my advocacy work, I've, I've had multiple priorities throughout the years. Um, and I think knowing that um, those can change, but at the time, that is my priority. That's what I'm working on. When I'm using or talking to people I have relationships with, they know that that's what we're talking about at that time um, can really help with that success because you're really focused. And then 
having leadership experience, whether that be in policy or in science policy or communication or outside of, um, my first leadership experience was actually outside of science policy. Um, but knowing that you can sit at a table and chair a meeting, um, that you can throw the conversation focus from one person to another, and that you can guide um, the way that you're talking about a policy with a group um, in order to you know, go into like a, an office at the state level or at the university level or federal level and advocate, those skills are very important um, and you can gain those a lot of different ways, but I definitely think seeking that out early was really important for me. And then community support. So where you're, this is different from organizational buy-in because this is people that don't have organizations per se, people that don't hold formal institutional power. Um, these are people that may have experienced things related to what you're advocating for, um, may be someone who can help you, but you wouldn't know unless you were out at an event in the community or calling people and asking questions or just connecting with folks that are, you know, at the same university as you are in the same town. Um, but having those organic connections in your community can really behoove you uh, in the future. And I think a big part of this, and the reason it's hard to give advice on this particular topic is because a lot of it's serendipity. So it's being in the right place and having that conversation with someone. And then remembering three years later, oh, I've met this person now I think that I can connect them to this issue area, or now I think they would be a great person to call, call on and say, hey, are you interested in this opportunity? Um, I think that was something that was really key for me in building uh, my, my political, I guess, advice and team and <laughs> just everyone that built up to running for office. Um, so when I decided to run, I, was told by a lot of people that I needed to have a story. And I think one of the hardest parts about it is you are told, whether you be running for office or just advocating for something, that you have to have a narrative that you are using to sell a thing. And it felt to me somewhat disingenuous, some of the advice I received. And I think probably the best piece of advice I got along the way was just the thing that you were passionate about, lead with that and have that reflection that you've done be your why. And people will agree and people will disagree and know that because you have done that reflection um, and because you have your, your reasons for things, um, that you can have hard conversations. Um, I ran in a district here in Missouri, Missouri 4, that is a, I would say it's a bridge between rural Missouri and urban Missouri. It includes uh, Columbia, which is about 100, and, I guess it's 120,000 people now. So in Missouri, it's actually a sizable town. <laughs> Uh, and then a bunch of rural Missouri uh, is the rest of the district. So it's 24 counties. And it had had the same person representing it for about eight years when I ran. And I think being able to go out and have, again, that community connection, those conversations uh, was probably the most challenging part. Um, but I was through my advocacy work previously, I had practiced having those serendipitous conversations and connecting with people. Um, but this was just kind of on steroids going out. Um, and it is challenging, actually, um, as a scientist, someone who is steeped in, you know, being able to talk about technical details and methods and being rigorous and talking um, really, I mean, it's just think like lab meeting or something, you know, you're, you're pushing on colleagues and saying, well, why did you do this? And what was this for? Um, and being steeped in that type of like day to day, it was really hard for me to step out of it and then go in and have conversations with people that uh, don't know what a lab meeting would be or uh, really care that much about the methods that I use in my research. Um, and so trying to explain 
why I cared so much about, you know, public funding of research and universities and access to that research and farming and <laughs> all of these things that are important for the district, but they're very separate from the people of the district. Uh, that was a big challenge. And that is most definitely a challenge, whether you're running for office, whether you are advocating for an issue area, um, or if you are just, I mean, frankly, trying to explain to your relatives what you do. Science communication um, is a huge challenge. And that is definitely a skill um, that any of us that are interested in doing advocacy work should definitely be honing. Um, and then remembering that Along the way, um, whatever, if, if you're advocating for something um, or if you are running for an office, whatever that is, you're going to be learning and to remember to be able to evolve along the way, to not get stuck in, this is what I thought three years ago, or this is where I was prior to this conversation, but to realize that you're there to teach others and have conversations and through that um, to be the best representative you can be of either people you are advocating on behalf of or those that you're trying to represent, you really should be learning along the way and thinking about what people have to say to you. And it, it can be really challenging. Um, there are a lot of conversations I've had where I just wanted to like knocking doors. I just wanted to, to turn around and <laughs> walk away because uh, they were Sometimes people were mad, sometimes people were frustrated, and it turned out to be some of the conversations that I wanted to initially leave were the ones that were the most rewarding um, at the end of the day. Okay, so I kind of talked about these, um, but I want to highlight them as that I think prior to jumping into something and committing um, to advocating for a particular area, you should reflect on why you're doing this and what you're advocating for. Um, and then learning as you go, um, again, stopping and reflecting and saying, how are we doing and what can we do better uh, as a team? And then remembering, <laughs> and actually this, this is really key too when you're working with a team, of course, is listening to your stakeholders and others, but also listening to your team. Um, is just as important as what you personally have to say oftentimes. Uh, so pausing and listening um, is something that I struggle with. I like talking and uh, being able to make space for that is something that's really key if you're going to be advocating for others. And then get, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, I'm actually really uncomfortable talking to my computer. It's very hard for me. Uh, I like audience feedback and I receive very little whenever I'm talking on Zoom. Uh, so I'm a little uncomfortable right now. <laughs> uh, but I think it's really good to be able to practice what you preach. So that's what I'm trying to do right now. All right, so if anybody has any questions about my experiences or anything I learned along the way or just about you and you wanna tell me something about why you're interested in advocacy and if you have any questions right now I think it's a good time to just pause for that. Um, I have a question. So how did you as um, I guess as an under I guess as you're like going through balance, like how did you, I guess it's really a long winded way of saying, how did you balance out, I was trying to think on my feet, how did you balance like that academic, um, like I have to like make grades and do things in the lab and like I have to, you know, be engaged in the community. It seems like really basic, but I feel like something that a lot of graduate students, just because we're crunched for time that we often forget is like the town and gown aspect of like our life. Um, and it just seems like it's really important because there's a lot of po important policy decisions that get made at the local level. And very often like folks just kind of like come to those towns and they just live there. And it's like, all right, well, I'm going home for the holidays. They're like, oh, well, I graduated by So like, and I feel like if you're invested, then that doesn't happen. So how did you find yourself getting invested? Yeah, so I think 
I mean, even at the university level too, Patrick, I think that's true. It's like, you're not getting invested with the politics of your university or with the decisions being made there. And you're just there doing your work and you're not necessarily saying, hey, I don't like this policy. I think I want to get involved in this. Um, that can be really hard to do too. Um, I think that the answer to this, probably step one is having a conversation with your academic advisor. Um, whether you be a graduate student or a postdoc, um, I think having a conversation about, I'm interested in this, this is something that I do want to do, and I am going to still get my work done in the lab, and I'm going to do this as well because this is really important for us. This is really important for the university, or this is really important for the lab, for our research. I mean, most of the things that I worked on and that I've seen other graduate students and postdocs work on um, are things that are relevant to our areas of research or to the potential for our future areas of research, funding, et cetera. Um, and so I think that is a really good step one. And then step two, I think, uh, and this is really hard and I do struggle with this because I get really passionate about things and I, and I dive in and I spend all my time on it. <laughs> but I think establishing really clear boundaries and being really clear on this is the project that I said I was going to work on and I'm spending this much time on it and doing that both in your research area and in your advocacy work as well. Um, it's easy to have both of them really just expand and expand and expand until they start to take over um, one or the other. Uh, and I think being really intentional about that and, you know, maybe even check ins like once a month and saying, how am I doing? Have I been spending too much time on this? And you can do that with, with your team. You can do that with your advisor. Um, and if you do have people you're working with on advocacy, you can say, right now is a really hard time for me. I have comps in two months. I need, I need you to take the burden right now. Are you able to do that? Um, and I think that's, that's another thing that can be really helpful in establishing that balance. Um, but I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. It's really hard. Um, if you're passionate about something, it's definitely doable, but it, it is a challenge. Thank you. Um, we have two more questions in the chat. The first one, um, this person is asking, the entry point itself has always felt the most intimidating for me. How did you initially get your foot in the door and how did you keep the momentum? Yeah, and that's the hard part to explain because really getting your foot in the door, um, it varies so much depending on what area you're working in exactly. So specific example to me is, um, so when I first started working on like student loans and visas and other topic areas, I got my foot in the door through my local leadership. So I was the elected president for our graduate student body. And through that, I was able to start working somewhat on advocacy work because that organization also did local and national advocacy. They connected then with national nonprofits, a number of them. And I started getting connections to those nonprofits through our local work. Um, and then I just started saying, hey, I'm interested in this and I wanna work on it. And they said, well, we always need people and these are things you can do. And I just started trying to figure out which one was right for me and ended up working as the director of legislative affairs for the National Association of Grad Professional Students. That was really my first in for like a formal federal advocacy position. Um, I really think, unfortunately, it's hard to have a specific path for it. Um, but I do think asking questions and being really curious and then starting to just get involved, whether it's formally or informally with an organization that has a network already established um, is a really great way to get started. Um, and unfortunately right now in the time of COVID, uh, it's, it's a little bit harder to just like, as I did um, in like 2015, I just walked into a networking session, you know, and was like, hi, this is who I am and started meeting people. But I also think that we can do that via Zoom. We can do that. I mean, right now, um, if anyone, and I'm gonna say this again later, I'm gonna repeat it like three times because I think it's very key. If you need a connection to a connection to a connection, ask. I'm offering myself right now as a resource. Um, I don't know who asked the question. I'm not looking at the chat right now, but um, I would be happy to be a resource if I can be helpful at all to connect you to someone that might be a helpful platform for you. 
Thank you. We actually have a couple of them. Um, we have like three more questions. Um, and just for folks, it's great that you're asking questions. Um, if you ask them through the Q&A feature, it might be a little easier for us to manage them. But if you're ans asking them through the chat, no big deal. Um, the next one is, do you think it is possible as a plant science, as a plant scientist to contribute to policy without being involved in politics? I think that in your experience, policy and politics are together. Yeah, so it's actually, it, I have two different experiences. Yes, policy and politics are together um, and many of them, but the one where policy and politics are not together is the Missouri Science and Technology Policy Fellows Program. Um, and that basically places the fellows in a nonprofit that then serves as a resource for legislators. And they are basically like a nonpartisan resource um, for understanding background of like different policies and helping to write um, policies with a technical background. Um, and so I, I do think it's, it's possible um, to contribute to policy being nonpartisan and and trying to be someone who is there informing um, policymakers. I also think that <laughs> bridging that right now is harder than it has ever been. Um, being able to be someone who is there as like a technical resource in an informal capacity is very challenging. Um, I think having an organization that serves as a technical resource or as a scientific background sounding board um, can be a way to do that. Um, but on your own, um, there there is a tendency for people to see you as political and as biased and coming from a particular perspective. Um, I also want to push back a little bit and challenge that by saying that I do think most things in our world and our life um, are quite political. And it's not necessarily a bad thing that things are political because it does stimulate discussion and disagreement. And at the end of the day, done in a functional way, um, that can be extremely beneficial. Um, and we end up coming to better decisions after that. Again, done in a functional way. <laughs> um, actually, I find that universities are some of the most political places that I've ever um, interacted, um, interacting with administrators and students that are negotiating where we're going to end up has been one of the most political endeavors that I've ever undergone. Um, and so I would steer away from necessarily seeing um, political as a negative connotation um, in every context. Thank you for that. Um, we have two more. Um, the first one is, how were you able to advise from a neutral standpoint when asked for advice compared to when you were expected to advocate for a bill or topic? How were you able to set a clear boundary between switching roles as advising and advocacy? Yeah, so that it comes down to, so for me, it was very challenging at one point, I had about a year there where I was in three different positions and I had to wear different hats. Um, and I would explicitly tell people um, when I was in a meeting that I am here on behalf of um, NAGPS and NAGPS's stance on this is. And I would be really explicit in that particular perspective. Um, or if I was there with ASPB, we actually went through training um, and had a discussion, like a half a day discussion before we went into offices where we talked about, you know, this is, this is ASPB's particular stance on this. And this is what we're going into offices to talk about. And we're gonna share our personal experiences um, but we're also sharing uh, the research, right? We're, we're sharing this thing that is from a research standpoint, not necessarily from a, this bill should be the sponsored bill. We're telling them what the research says so they can then do their jobs, which is to inform policy decisions or to make policy decisions. Uh, so I guess maybe the simplest way to think about this is our job when we are advocating um, can be doing it from a standpoint from research or from personal experience or what have you. But the role of the policymaker is always to integrate that information from us, whether it be from scientific perspective or otherwise, and then to turn it into policy or into a bill's language or modify that. Um, and so being able to tell them 
that <laughs> clear role that you are playing when you're advising them or when you're advocating with them can change the way they use your advice, but oftentimes it also won't change the way they use your advice. Um, they will see you the way they see you um, based on their perceptions. Um, so it, it's squishy basically is the best answer to that. Um, and you're gonna have to figure out who you're talking to and how they are going to perceive you specifically before you go into that situation um, and decide what hat you need to tell them you're wearing. Patrick, I'm sorry, I'm so long-winded. No, good, these questions are also good. Thank they you. They are. Everybody who's asked these questions, these are great nuanced questions. The last one that we have is, what does the day-to-day -day of some of the advocacy roles you have have look like? Um, gosh, this is a hard one. So day-to-day -day for advocacy, often looks like, so I've done more grassroots advocacy um, and less advocacy where I am the point person always. So I did a lot of taking um, people's information if they were interested in, in being involved, curating lists of those people, inviting them to uh, digital events in person, like fly-in advocacy events in DC, um, I spent a lot of my time actually writing, um, how do I explain funding for uh, research to like graduate students that don't understand the federal budget? And then how do I explain to them how then to explain that back to policymakers? So I spent a lot of time writing up training materials related to that um, and thinking about strategically how we could be most effective uh, in the way we're communicating. I would say a lot of my advocacy was really focused on strategy and was really focused on, I talked about it a little bit earlier, but when you're in the science space and when you're talking about these complex topics, it's really important to focus on that science communication piece um, and how we actually break down these complex things into something that can be digested by a policymaker or their staffer and then re-communicated because that's often what they want from folks that are in their office is they want something that they can go to their colleagues and they can say this is really important i'm going to vote yes on this but i wanted you to know you know and if they're trying to re-communicate it and it's complicated it becomes an issue of telephone um, and so i thought a lot about that whenever i was working in advocacy Awesome, thank you. I think those are all the questions that we have for now. Okay, all right. Well, I will go on to the second part and I'll have another break for questions at the end. So. Maybe. Okay, so uh, this section I wanted to, and we already had a question about this, like this jumping off point, but I'm glad we had that question because <laughs> this is really complicated. And I think understanding that your research skills and your ability to just jump into the unknown and have a question uh, and then start trying to address that question is actually an extremely helpful set of skills for starting to get involved in something new like advocacy. So that'd be my first piece of advice is just start exploring. You know, if you're interested in this and you know the area you're interested in, or even an area that you might be interested in, start just looking it up, find people that already do it and organizations that already do it and just start asking questions about it. Um, and the second part is really also thinking more deeply about this exploration. So what kind of structures are there that already exist? Um, and then within those structures that already exist in advocacy and science policy, are there opportunities at your community level, at your university, in your city, state, or federal government? Um, and then through those different areas of advocacy or of government or <laughs> nonprofit, whatever, um, how do you start to get involved? Um, are there places you can apply for an internship? Are there places you could do like a, a couple hours a week in volunteer work? Um, or is it something that you want to do whenever you're finished with your degree or your postdoc? Um, is it is this a job job? 
Um, and then also what kind of things you need to do now to prepare for these potential opportunities. Um, I know I have a lot of questions right here, um, but I think the best way to start really is with those questions, um, because depending on where you are, a lot of these answers are going to vary. Um, for example, in Missouri and in a lot of Midwest states, um, we are under-resourced um, nonprofit wise in many areas. So finding a place to start to volunteer at that's in science policy locally in let's say one of the small towns in rural Missouri is basically impossible. Um, at, or finding um, something at your city level is probably not going to happen. However, if you're in a larger city, um, it might be an overly complicated <laughs> situation where the landscape of nonprofits and the landscape of potential um, places to get involved might be really confusing because there are so many. Um, and so the answers to these questions are going to vary widely. I also think though one way to start navigating that complexity is through talking with people that have experience. Um, and the reason this is this is somewhat of a difficult seminar to to think about trying to frame because you're from all over the country. And my experience is very specific to Missouri and it's very specific to DC. And I am, I have a pretty large nationwide network, but it's in the areas that I have done my advocacy. Um, I'm always happy to connect um, people. And I know other people that I know who have experience in a lot of different areas across the country are always happy to connect. Um, there's one thing about the advocacy and policy world uh, that I do know. And it's that they always want people that are interested um, to reach out and are, even though they're time limited oftentimes, and they might not respond to your first email, definitely remind them um, because they do want new contacts and they're really excited for new people to start to get involved. Um, so find someone who is the director of legislative affairs or someone who is the policy director um, for a nonprofit or for a university or at the city level who advocates at the state um, and reach out and see if they'll connect you with someone or have a meeting with you. And then once you've started to build those networks, the key really in successful advocacy is to maintain, um, to make sure that those people that you have made connections with are whether that be monthly or quarterly or yearly, um, someone that you can reach out to and ask questions of or reach out to and say, hey, we're having this meeting, would you be able to talk at it? Uh, and that can be really challenging. So I, I personally always make a plan for my networking. Otherwise, I end up talking to people <laughs> all day long that are really fun to talk to and really interesting, but aren't necessarily going to be that helpful for you know, my monthly goal of trying to figure out some of the background of a certain policy and trying to get a group together to write up a memo. Uh, and so I think having a plan with that in that maintenance phase of your network is really key. So for all of you, um, some personal reflections that I think are helpful in getting started and frankly, even just checking in um, throughout your process. And this is related to the balance that Patrick asked about earlier is, how much time do you wanna to commit to an endeavor like this, to advocating, to being involved in policy work? Um, and is there a particular area that you are passionate about or multiple areas? And how much time do you want to commit to each of those? And I would say you're here and you are already thinking about this um, through listening to the seminar. So that's a really good first step to, to jumping in um, because hopefully it'll start to get you thinking about potential areas um, that you might wanna get involved in the future and how much time you wanna spend on it. So some organizations uh, that might be helpful, and this is not a comprehensive list. I did not want to list out all of the organizations that may be useful. Um, I, I believe there are already compilations of organizations in science policy um, that are curated by, I think AAAS has one, I think um, as long as, or as far as national science policy organizations are concerned, the National Science Policy Network also curates lists of other organizations. Um, 
as far as national nonprofits that advocate for policy changes specifically, um, NAGPS, um, National Association of Grad Professional Students, is a really good one that can always use more help from early career scientists. Um, and then, you know, getting creative with this, there are always state or local nonprofit organizations that are focused in, let's say, medical sciences or within plant biology or within even specific areas within that. Um, that are working at the state level, that are working at the local level um, to talk to, you know, mayors or to talk to local legislators about their, their issue areas. And I think oftentimes what happens is those more local nonprofits have more opportunity for engagement. It's volunteer positions often, <laughs> but they tend to be under-resourced and are always looking for help. So I think sometimes that's a really good place to start. Um, and then to go beyond that, um, to work with more national nonprofits um, and other university-based organizations, once you've had some experience under your belt, um, could be a good way to go about it. Also, getting elected into a student government position or serving on a board of your university science policy or science communication group um, can be a really good way to get your feet wet. Um, I did both of those things um, back in 2013 to 2016. And they both were really great experiences that allowed me to meet people in my community that I wouldn't have met otherwise. And so that was really great for network building and skill building, that leadership piece we were talking about earlier as well. And then, and this one's really, really great. I recently served on the, um, so it's a new, it's the Climate Commission now. It was the task force for climate, um, the mayoral task force in Columbia, Missouri, which I served on by appointment from the mayor uh, in, 2018, 2019, uh, just after my run for Congress. And being part of that task force and then turned commission uh, was something that I had not done previously at the city level. Um, but there are numerous boards and commissions that the city government and the county government run that they are always looking for subject matter experts. And that type of position is something that we often don't think about when we're thinking about policy um, because we tend to go toward either elected officials at the state or federal level or toward a nonprofit organization. And these institutions are often <laughs> missing a lot of expertise um, from the community, but also specifically from the scientific community um, because they're overlooked. And so I would definitely encourage you to, if you're interested in more local government, that is an avenue that could be really interesting for you. And then areas of advocacy, I just put together a short list here. I mean, sky's the limit as far as areas of advocacy. Uh, there are so many things to dig in on and get passionate about. I mean, something I didn't list here, of course, is the farm bill. The farm bill is something that, you know, gets renewed. Well, it, the cycle depends, <laughs> but it, it'll be coming up for a renewal here in a few years. Um, but you could advocate for student visa policy changes, um, general visa policy, um, student loans, and the interest rate associated with those loans, um, new and emerging tech policy, so UAVs, um, genetic modification of organisms and the policies surrounding that. Um, graduate worker rights, um, federal funding of research. Um, so this would be open access to publicly funded research. Um, any of these could be relevant to you or your lab or your area of research um, and may have impact in the long term. And so they'd be something that might be easier to have a conversation about um, with your academic advisor or with people that you might want to work with um, on advocating for these. And I know organizations that work on each of these at different levels of government. So uh, to summarize, I wanna leave plenty of time for questions. General steps for getting involved. And you know, this is something I thought about quite a bit because <laughs> It can, it can look very different 
um, for different people. But I, I think the really the key first step is exploring your own interest and building your background knowledge on topic areas that you might want to get involved in and also on structure. So understanding if you want to be involved at un your university, what are the organizations that you can get involved with? Um, who is the person who's in charge of making these decisions and why are they the important ones to talk with about this? Um, and the same is true at no matter the level is figuring out who those um, power brokers are and how to get a conversation with them. Building your network um, after you've gained some of that knowledge and understood the structure going out to meet people uh, that are part of that community that are part of that structure um, and making yourself known then you know finding and solidifying where you're working or what you're working on um, and i should add to this who you'll be working with um, it could be some of those people that you met um, through your community network building um, it, and often it is, <laughs> it's people that you've met that have the same passion as you. And you say, hey, do you wanna work on this project with me? Um, and I think refining your network, so revisiting your network um, and reaching out to more people as you start to hone this topic area, as you start to, let's say you're writing a policy memo or you're actually endeavoring to write a policy that you want to find a legislator to introduce. Um, finding the people in your network again, reaching out to them and saying, this is my progress. This is how it's going. Um, do you, will you look at it? Will you give me advice? Will you help me at this meeting? Um, and sometimes at this step, you might need to engage with a new organization or found a new organization to start in on your work or to complete your work. Um, because the next steps often <laughs> become the hardest and the most long-term uh, as far as the success is concerned, which this is where we start meeting with stakeholders and policymakers related specifically to, you know, a white paper or memo that you've written or policy that you're trying to get introduced. Um, so you'll continue strategizing and writing here and building coalitions and setting up meetings with policymakers and hopefully the people that are part of your network now can be meeting also with those policymakers and helping you um, because this can be really time consuming. Um, and then building relationships with these policymakers and their staffers and ensuring that they know they can rely on you for information um, and reach back out to you as a resource is something that can be really helpful here too. Um, and then repeating the cycle. So going back and, you know, if you've done something that you feel like has been successful and you've informed people about something and action has happened, you know, going back and exploring your interest again and building your background knowledge and starting all over um, can be really fun. Okay, so back to questions. Um, I don't want to spend forever giving you all general advice. I want to dig into some specifics. So I had some prompts on here about like, if I can help with resources, if anything would be useful, if you thought a specific um, reflection or decision worksheet might be helpful, I can definitely make one. I tried to make one and it just, it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to be. So I think I need some input um, from what you all need. And then I was um, also wanted to bring up research advocacy work balance and then how this experience can be helpful for job applications is another thing that I haven't touched on. So I'm going to go ahead and there's a question actually in the chat on um, another one. Um, and this one is what about science policy are you passionate about and what is the driving force behind your work? Oh, me. <laughs> uh, so I think the thing I'm most passionate about actually is that and it goes all the way back to my undergrad, is that policy itself is kind of, or more should be a science. So we should be as policymakers or as aspiring policymakers, which is what I am, uh, <laughs> looking at the world and seeing this is something that needs to change or doesn't work the way it was intended. And I think that if we change this, it'll work better. And talking to people and learning more about it, collecting information and then implementing that and tracking. Is it actually better? Is it not better? What about it is better? 
And then again, re-implementing better policy or hopefully a better policy and tracking. And I feel like the thing that I'm the most passionate about is that we have the power to do that, whether we be a policymaker or someone who's just talking with policymakers and advocating. Um, and I have seen change that is inspired by, you know, new research that is unearthing things that we didn't know before, whether that be actual like physical sciences research or just looking at some data that no one ever thought to look at before um, in the policy realm. So I guess seeing that change most lately has kind of been my inspiration. And it's been mostly at the local level recently. Um, but yeah, that is such a hard question too, because it's an ever evolving question is what I find. Um, but I think rediscovering your inspiration and rediscovering your passion is also something that's extremely important. And I find that very easy in policy. Awesome. So I think that's it for the chats, but I was going to ask, would it be feasible to like have like a tangible resource, like a worksheet or something like that, maybe like sometime in the future so that um, other ECPSs or ECRs could like um, be like less intimidated about jumping into policy and like they maybe have like some tangible things they can look at like, okay, like this is maybe where I could start. Absolutely. I actually have a draft already. I just I just didn't like it. <laughs> oh, totally understandable. Yeah, I think one of the challenges for me, and maybe we could ask if people could provide input on this, is I think probably one of the biggest barriers is that entry point. Like, how do I get started? And so I had a lot on that. Um, but are there other barriers that would be worth um, addressing and like trying to provide resources on? And I'm also trying to make this not just something that would be useful this year, but something that would be a resource that might be a little less of like a time capsule. So, got it, got it. yeah. Um, and then I'd also like to say to the to the um, audience, um, I've seen a couple of people mention a few affinity groups in the chat. Um, thank you for doing that, and feel free to do that. I think we have a few folks who. Um, are from a European policy group that is absolutely awesome. Um, so whether they're domestic or international, um, it's I think that this would absolutely be the space to let people know that you're working on policy. Yeah. So I also put a link to our Plante Community Discussion Board into the chat. I think that that's also a great way to continue these discussions. So um, for any of you who are maybe not yet joined up for that, um, you can sign up for free and you can post a discussion question to kind of continue um, to share all these resources and to be able to connect with other plant scientists um, that are interested in this work. So yes, thank you all for attending. Um, thank you for all of these excellent resources. And thank you, Hallie and Patrick, um, for being here and organizing it and speaking. It's been a really great discussion. Thank you, everybody, for attending as well. Thank you, Hallie. And thank you, for Katie, for coordinating this. This was awesome. It was great to um, provide these resources for everybody. And we hope that um, people were able to take these and um, implement great policy changes um, wherever they live at the local, uh, state, or national level. Hi, everyone.